Today on BRCV Investigates, we examine some interesting end user claims on Marine Pure. Hi, I'm Ryan, your host of Beers TV Investigates, a weekly YouTube series which explores popular reefing theories, products, methods, what the manuals are missing with a focus on putting them to the test. Today we're testing, can Marine Pure remove nitrate from your system? To be fair, Marine Pure is really designed to quickly and efficiently process ammonia and nitrite in the system into relatively safe nitrate. And it does that by providing a tremendous amount of surface area and interconnected pore structure. This block has 23,000 cubic feet of surface area and while it might seem like a solid block, water flows straight through the open pore network even though it's over 4 inches thick. In addition to processing ammonia and nitrite, the literature does claim the product will minimize nitrates, which is what we're testing today. Minimize is a less definitive word, which I'm sure is intentionally a little bit vague and something not always stated, but so many end users have claimed significant nitrate reductions using the product, I think it's kind of worked its way in there over time. Well, not definitively proven, the fact is a lot of people have shared experiences where they've had high nitrates, dropped a block in the sump, and weeks to months later, the nitrate levels were already down significantly. I think the theory here is similar to the belief that live rock is performing a nitrate reduction deep within the rock in an oxygen-free zone. It is certainly possible that the flow through the large block is also providing a similar low oxygen environment where the nitrate can transition into nitrogen gas and then bubble out of the tank. There's a decent amount of debate as to if there truly are anaerobic or oxygen-free zones in the marine pier because it is so porous. However, unless you're blasting it with water, the flow through the center of the block is likely pretty slow, which certainly could allow the bacteria time to strip all the oxygen off the outer layer of the brick. Beyond that, to make things a bit more complex, a lot of reefers believe there needs to be an organic carbon source for the transition to nitrogen gas to happen in any environment. However, everything the hobby thinks it knows about the nitrogen cycle and the complex chain of bacteria which filter our tanks ranges from generally accepted scientific concepts to anecdotal theory based on individual or cumulative results, much of what I call seemingly plausible theory, but pretty far from fact. Even the top scientists and thought leaders on the topic will share there's a significant amount of room to better understand what's happening in our tanks in relation to the nitrogen cycle. Behind the scenes, I can share we've already had some test results which really challenged some of the concepts that we base all of our systems on. I'm going to tell you right now that there were some hard lessons learned in the testing approach that we'll openly share with you today. Experiments or tests that involve something as complex as transitional bacterial populations certainly require more thought and planning to get usable results. The results ended up being what I would call pretty inconclusive and really only of value in learning how to improve the next experiment. Something that's pretty typical to a lot of experiments, research, plan, learn, adapt. What we learn from the failed experiments is often just as important as the successes. Before we go through what went wrong, I'd like to share our approach and the initial results. The test was pretty simple, four tanks with heaters and power heads, one large block of marine pier, one plate, a box of the balls with flow and a CPR refugium, and a control tank which had nothing, just a clean glass tank. All fed a single cube of blended mysis a day, we blended it to promote a more rapid breakdown. Since there's no fish in the tank to eat and process it, the initial testing method was using a standard Hawk nitrate reagents with calibrations for seawater. These are the results after nine weeks starting with the control. You can see the results shot up pretty quickly at week four where the nitrates hit close to 60 parts per million, then peaked at nearly 90 parts per million a few weeks later, and then fell all the way down into the 30s. We saw another peak and the levels dropped back down to 55 parts per million at the end. We certainly could have taken this further and attempted to see if this stabilized at some point, but ultimately felt there are some elements about this test we should just change and start over. I wish I had a definitive explanation why the nitrate was spiking and then mysteriously dropping. I don't think many reefers would assume that there's a mechanism for nitrate to fall like that in an empty glass tank with no filtration. The most plausible explanation that we could come up with is the biomass within the bacterial blooms is consuming and releasing the nitrate. The tank certainly has had a cloud in it for the entire test, which would indicate that that's a possibility. Moving on to the large 4 inch thick block, it was a bit more stable, we didn't see the cloud in the water the entire time, and the levels were largely between 10 and 20 parts per million for the first two months of the test, then they suddenly skyrocketed in week 10 to over 60 parts per million, but ultimately ended up at 56 parts per million, which was only one off the control at week 14. So ultimately the block and the control ended up at the same point but took drastically different paths to get there. I'll say the initial results of the first two months were pretty compelling and we thought we had a winner here for sure. That may still be the case and we'll likely find that out in the next evolution of this test. 
We also tested the one inch thick plate. With the plate, we saw very similar results of largely between 10 and 20 parts per million nitrate in the first two months. And then it suddenly shot up to 122 parts per million, but rapidly fell down to 50 parts per million in week 14. Meaning again, while they all took different paths to get there, at week 14, they all ended up around 50 to 55 parts per million, which is not a relevant difference for this period of time. So at first glance, I think the results might say the marine pier media doesn't have a significant nitrate minimizing effect. However, at the same time, I can't ignore how well they performed against the controls for the first two months. And after 14 weeks and 70 cubes of food with no other export method, I'd expect to see higher nitrate levels than what they ended up at. So let's talk about where we went wrong here so we can improve the next evolution of this test. First, the goal with these experiments is to intentionally limit the interferences to begin with so we can confidently test and explore very specific elements. Then based on that, evolve the test into more real world environments. In this case, we wanted to start with an uncycled tank, which meant responsibly we shouldn't put fish in it. We also wanted to start with a nitrogen source reefers would be familiar with and applicable to their own tanks like a cube of frozen food. However, we didn't want to wait for it to rot in the tank, so we blended the cube up and poured it in, which is not typical to a real reef tank. We also relied on the glass and the control to be enough surface area for the bacteria simply because we didn't want to incorporate any other type of filter into the control which could have a completely unknown impact. We also elected to only test nitrate because the assumption was after a month or so the bacteria population would have built up and processed all the ammonia and nitrite into nitrate regardless. We did test ammonia and nitrite periodically which were always near zero but I think we'd all like to see week to week results in a test like this. And thankfully, this is the last time I'm going to have to say this, but for all of you that have been following along with this series, you know the initial Hawk results using their stock nitrate reagents didn't perform as well as we would have liked, so the results are not as accurate as I'd like as well. This is the last test that used that undesirable Hawk reagent method, so from this point on, all of our tests will be using the new method using the Hawk DR3900 to read reagents specifically designed for seawater and reef tanks. There was also some human error added into the mix, and even though he's done an awesome job in relation to building and performing all the testing here, I'm going to throw our R&D guy and my personal friend straight under the bus. At week 12, Aaron accidentally lost or threw away the test results sheet for the marine pier balls that we were also testing. I have to say this is particularly disappointing because the balls were actually even more stable than the block and plate and they had some pretty interesting results. However, at week 14, the nitrate was at 56 parts per million and almost identical to the other tests. Lastly, there are a lot of tests the reefing community would like us to look into and space is certainly a premium. So redundant tests with repeatable results just isn't realistic for every single experiment. That said, I think that this one's complex enough that redundancy is absolutely required to produce results that have any value at all. So end of story, I don't think we showed anything here definitively other than our testing approach was flawed in multiple ways from the onset. But I do think that we learned a lot which we can apply to future tests. Well, it isn't set in stone yet. I think we're going to evolve this test in the following ways. I don't think a true control with no filter is going to produce valuable results. So rather than test a marine pier against itself in a control glass box, I think it'd be wise to widen the scope and test against other filtration methods. So we're going to test a marine pier block, a very porous live rock with cured pucani, more dense live rock with cured reef saver, and a simple air-driven sponge filter. We selected these four filtration types because there are commonly presumed differences between them all. Starting with the air-driven sponge filter, it's certainly presumed to be capable of supporting bacteria, which can convert ammonia and resulting nitrite into nitrate, but I don't think anyone thinks that they're effective reducers of nitrate. A lot of reefers believe the internal layers of fairly porous live rock like Pucani is capable of processing nitrate into nitrogen gas which bubbles out of the tank and effectively reduces nitrate levels in the tank. The inverse of that is more dense sources of rock like Reef Saver presumably don't allow for a significant amount of flow through the internal layers of the rock. So I think a lot of reefers believe the transition to nitrogen gas in dense rock is less likely to happen or at least does it so slowly that the net nitrate reduction in the tank is fairly minimal. And I think everyone believes that the marine pier in its wealth of porous surface area is capable of rapidly filtering the ammonia and nitrite, but it's kind of up in the air how well it will handle nitrate and the related transition into nitrogen gas. 
We're also going to put fish into the tank, which more closely mimics the intended use of the filters. Related to that, all the different filtration methods are going to have to be cycled to responsibly protect the fish. This week, we added all the various filters to our Vertex testing station, while the rest for four weeks before we restart the test. I think starting with uncycled filters in the previous test was part of the reason why the numbers were so unstable. We're also going to use a real food source, either pellets or frozen cubes, but not blended. While blending the cubes did prevent an accumulation of a bunch of rotting shrimp at the bottom of the tank, it's certainly possible that blending the cubes and resulting rapid nutrient availability was potentially why we saw what appeared to be constant bacterial blooms in a couple of the tanks. In addition to a more accurate and reliable nitrate testing method, we also installed commercial level Senai modules on some of the test tanks so we can monitor ammonia closely, and we added nitrite testing into the results so we can get a full picture on how each filter is functioning at each stage. Stage. Lastly, we'll set up two of each test with the same parameters in hopes of finding repeatable results. I just don't think the results in this case are valuable if they're not easy to replicate. I think there's going to be some real value into looking at how the different media types support the bacterial colonies which filter our tanks. There's certainly a lot of assumptions out there on how they all perform. Well, today's results, our approach, evolution of the test, and your thoughts on how this is all going to play out is certain to stir up some debate on our Reef to Reef thread, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts on the link pinned down below. As always, if you value what we're doing here, give us a quick thumbs up and support and subscribe because we release new videos like this one every week. See you next Friday with another BRS TV Investigates.